And in terms of electing someone, there's a lot of names that are coming around more in the uh, in the angle of the Republican Party, which are Nikki Haley, Vivek Rapaswamwani, and Donald Trump, and some that are potentially running, which are DeSantis and Mike Pompeo. And also, in terms of the Democratic Party, it seems that there's speculation that Biden may not run, or perhaps he's not leaning towards running, or maybe he will run. But these are all of the questions that I have for you. What are your thoughts in the Republican candidates? Are, is there anyone that really would you would be interested in in having as a next president? And also, what are your thoughts in a potential re-election of President Joe Biden? The, Rep the Republican organization is not a political party in the traditional sense. It that it has been turning into something quite different for several decades. In fact, uh, I agree with the uh, comments of the political analysts of the American Enterprise Institute, Thomas Mann, Norman Ornstein, that the Republicans have become what they call a radical insurgency that has abandoned the uh, procedures of uh, normal parliamentary politics. If you rank it internet, look at international rankings, its attitudes and commitments, it ranks alongside the far-right parties in Europe with uh, neo-fascist origins. The party is now pretty, the popular base of the party is pretty much in the pocket of Donald Trump. Uh, you look at polls, overwhelmingly popular. Uh, that's the end result of a long period. You can trace it back to Richard Nixon, in which the party recognized uh, back in, at that time, it was an authentic political party. Uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, whatever you thought about them, they pretty, pretty much overlapped in uh, the modes of procedure, uh, attitudes, and so on. The Republicans were the, the more pro-business of the two business parties in the United States. The United States is basically a one-party state. The business party uh, has two factions called Democrats and Republicans. The Republicans were more, the more dedicated pro-business party. Uh, Richard Nixon, intelligence strategist, understood that the Republicans cannot win elections on their actual programs. Their programs of strong support for the business world, for the ownership class, for investors, for, for banks and so on, can't get votes that way. So he recognized that what the Republicans ought to do is to shift attention away from their social economic policies to something else what are now called cultural issues. With Nixon, it was what was called the Southern strategy. Let's draw Southern Democrats to the Republican Party by barely concealed racism. By the mid 1970s, <coughs> Republican strategists, uh, Paul Virer in particular, recognized that if the Republicans pretended, I stress, pretend, to be opposed to abortion, they could pull in the huge evangelical vote, then being politicized for the first time, and the Northern Catholic vote. So they all switched on a dime. Uh, George H. W. Bush, Ronald Reagan had been strongly what's now called pro-choice, suddenly became what's now called pro-life almost instantly other leaders too. So that became a plank of the Republican Party. Uh, later on, uh, love of guns. Uh, later on, something else. Anything to keep people's attention away from the socioeconomic policies, which are very harmful for their own constituency. So you have to shift it. With Newt Gingrich, 
when he took over the House, this became almost an open war. He said, we have to declare war on the Democrats. Uh, and since then, it's been steady decline in this direction. It became uh, Donald Trump, who's a very good showman, was able to mobilize these ideas, these tendencies very successfully. So you look at his legislative program, one achievement, a major tax cut for the rich in the corporate sector, stabbing everyone else in the back. But you don't talk about that. What you talk about is uh, the great replacement, uh, uh, Democrats uh, being sadistic uh, pedophiles, uh, anything else. Just it's uh, kind of don't look behind the curtain, you know. It's uh, And that's been, um, you can understand the success. There has been a period of 45 years of what amounts to savage class war uh, against the general population. It's bipartisan, led by Republicans, started with Ronald Reagan, followed by Bill Clinton, Obama. And uh, it's, uh, it's called neoliberalism, but which has a technical definition. The definition of neoliberalism, you look it up in the dictionary, it says something about free markets, free enterprise. That's not what it is. Uh, the uh, It's basically class war. So yes, there is deregulation that gives free enterprise, but there's a footnote. Deregulation leads to financial crashes very quickly, in fact. Started right away in the Reagan administration. Continental Illinois bailout, homing, savings and home crisis. Uh, the business world understands that the way it works is get deregulation. We move towards monopolization quite naturally. We make risky investments, make a ton of money. When it all crashes, the uh, state comes in and the friendly taxpayer bails us out. We're seeing it right now, in fact, with the, uh, but it happens over and over. So it's a market. Uh, bailout economy uh, for the very rich and uh, many other things co cooperated. So Reagan and also Thatcher, his associate in this, uh, their first acts were to attack labor movement and uh, undermine it severely. That made good sense. The labor movement is the main way in which people can defend themselves in a vicious class war. So you have to eliminate the defenses. Uh, they used illegal means, but it didn't matter. This opened the door to the corporate sector to move in with massive efforts at strike breaking, undermining labor laws, uh, much of it illegal. But when you control the criminal state, it doesn't matter if what you're doing is illegal. And uh, many other things like this. I'll go through the details, like, for example, real wages for male workers are basically 1979. Productivity has increased, uh, goes to very few hands. We even have measures of it. The Rand Corporation, super respectable, uh, did a study of what they call politely <clears throat> the transfer of wealth from the working class and the middle class lower 90% of the population, transfer of wealth from them to the top 1%. Their estimate over the 40 years of class war, they don't call it that, is about $50 trillion. That's quite impressive class war, to steal $50 trillion from the working class and the middle class. And in order to get away with it, you have to shift attention away from the policies and go to cultural issues. Well, one of the effects of the class war has been to shatter the social order. People live with precarious existences, very little wealth. If you're Afro-American, virtually no wealth, uh, precarious jobs. Uh, maybe you'll be called tomorrow, maybe you won't. Uh, uh, 
associations dissolved, um, people are alone, atomized, angry, properly angry, resentful, rightly resentful, distrust institutions, rightly institutions don't work for them, very fertile terrain for demagogues. You get an accomplished megalomaniac narcissist like Donald Trump, who's a good showman. Uh, he can mobilize people on this basis. And from their point of view, it's understandable. Uh, the Republican organization now relies pretty heavily on a rural vote. Take a walk through a rural town, see what it looks like. Where's the industry? It's gone. Clinton uh, developed, uh, insisted on global uh, trade policies, which were designed to harm the American working class and to benefit rich entrepreneurs and investors. It's called NAFTA, World Trade Organization. It's not free markets, highly protectionist. It's one reason why drugs are out of sight in the United States, because of the highly protectionist elements of the um, investor rights agreement called free trade agreements are in our propaganda system. So the industry's gone, uh, stores are shuttered, homes are shuttered, young people are leaving, there's nothing there. Desperation. In fact, there's even an increase in mortality on the white working class, increase in mortality, unheard of in societies outside of war and pestilence. It's happening here. Economists call it deaths of despair. Well, you grab onto something. Maybe it'll be the church. Maybe it'll be the great replacement. The Democrats are bringing in immigrants to uh, undermine the white race. Uh, uh, almost half of Republicans believe that the Democratic Party is run by sadistic pedophiles who are trying to groom children, uh, one after another, crazy belief. And you can understand it. When your life is being taken away, you grab onto something. Well, it used to be things like, say, in the 1930s when I was growing up, you grabbed onto the labor unions which were then growing, developing, it's my own family, first generation working class. Uh, things were pretty harsh, much worse than today, objectively. But it was a hopeful period. I remember it very well. We're going to get together. We're going to get out of this together. We'll work together. There was a moderately sympathetic, sympathetic administration. Labor unions were not just wages. They were cultural institutions classes, adult education, meetings, discussions, concerts, even a week in the park in the Pocono Mountains for my uh, Catskill Mountains for my aunts who were unemployed seamstresses. It was a whole way of life gone. Reagan was a vicious, brutal killer and racist understood, or at least his advisors understood, we got to wipe this out. And that, and that's been the same pretty since Clinton joined in in his own way. Well, that's where we are now. We have an election coming up with one party, which is, for quite rational reasons, dedicated to undermining of democracy. They can't survive in a democratic system. Uh, you can't have a party whose sole commitment in policy is to enrich the very rich and the corporate sector and stab everyone else in the back. Can't run on those programs. So let's undermine democracy. Let's bring up issues like uh, democratic uh, pedophiles and uh, the great replacement. Uh, uh, whatever crazy idea comes along next, but just turn people's attention to that. And again, given the collapse, the attack on the social order, this is not too hard to do. That's one party. The other party is split. 
the Democratic Party, which still functions as a political party, is pretty much split between a Clintonite party management, which is part of the general assault, though with a slightly softer touch, and the sort of Sanders movement, which has a strong popular base, not much of a representation in Congress. Uh, and they are in the American system, doctrinal system, they're called radical. In fact, by international standards, they're mildly centrist. In fact, one of the editors of the London Financial Times, the major business journal, by no means a radical journal, uh, one of them quipped half jokingly, only half jokingly, that if Bernie Sanders was in Germany, he could be running for the conservative Christian Democrat Party. If you look at it, it's not false. Take a look at his programs. Universal health care, free higher education, uh, child care. Have that everywhere. You have it in Germany, Mexico, France. Uh, take up Brazil, look around the world. So these are mildly social democratic policies. The United States considered very radical. Uh, the United States has a very class conscious business class. This goes way back. That's why we have a very violent labor history, extremely violent, surprised conservative Europeans. But, uh, and uh, now even simple things like maternal care, care for a woman after childbirth. The only country that doesn't have it is the United States and a couple of Pacific Islands. Here is considered a very radical idea. Um, right now in France, people are out in the streets uh, demonstrating at Macron's version of neoliberalism, raising pension uh, age. Uh, here, nobody understands that, of course, everybody wants to work like a maniac to the last minute. Well, France, still people want to have decent lives. You raise the pension age, who are you attacking? Working people, not affluent professionals, not people like me, not people who work in offices. We live longer. Uh, you're a construction worker, a police officer. You're not going to live very long. It's a hard life. Raise the pension age. You have less uh, of a retirement to enjoy yourself, do whatever you want. So in France, that's fighting issues. Here, it's almost even unimaginable. Raise the pension age to 64. What's that about? I mean, Europeans, Americans work about a month or six weeks longer than Europeans because of the savage character of the uh, sort of the conservative business run system. It's not in the genes. You go back to the 1930s, my childhood, the United States led the way in social democracy. Europe was descending into fascism. The New Deal was offering hope for social democracy. It's later picked up in Europe. So it's not, it's not a law of nature. Um, these are um, basically questions of the character of class war. That's the essence of it. You're not allowed to talk about that in the United States. There's no such thing as class, no such thing, just everybody's middle class, whatever that's supposed to mean. Well, it's not the case. Now, there are people who give orders, there are people who follow orders, and that's class. Uh, if, and uh, you look at the uh, way this has developed over the years, yes, you know, there's been a constant class war takes different forms. Last 40 years, it's been pretty savage, not just in the United States, it's various forms elsewhere. In France, you see the forms, right? Like during Macron's period in office as prime minister, 
You look at the record, the rich have become richer, the workers have become stagnated or become poor. That's a mild form of the class war called neoliberalism. Uh, you find one or indeed the worst victims, those who suffered worst, were the global south. Uh, they were subjected to IMF structural adjustment programs, which had devastating effects in Latin America, Africa, and elsewhere. So the weaker are the ones who suffer most naturally. Professor